So it's nine o'clock. Tom, I ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Hello, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to the European colleague and good evening to our Asian colleague. So uh, welcome again to the World River and the Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. Today is uh, uh, webinar number eight of 2021. Um, we invite Professor Tom Bionti to talk about uh, the carbon burial in the coastal zone from the source to sink perspective. So uh, before I introduce Tom, uh, with this Friday, this coming Friday, we have other talk is given by Ella Salam from Egypt. He will talk about the challenges uh, of the now river Delta is facing. We know how bad the the Alexandria, for example, the city of the coastal erosion, the protection, the subsidence, the sea level rise, the uh, saltwater intrusion. So all that kind of uh, 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 environmental challenge now we were dealt with facing. Uh, Ella will give uh, us an update. So please mark your calendar at the same time this Friday. And um, so Tom, um, got his PhD from University of Maryland. And currently, uh, Tom is the full professor and John and Barry Thompson, chaired professor in ge geological science, University of Florida, Gainesville. Before he joined uh, uh, University of Florida, uh, Tom uh, studied uh, his uh, professor position at Tulane University and, and the Texas a and &M. So I remember I, I met Tom uh, 18 or 20 years ago when um, they had the real mar the river dominated marine margin workshop at Tuna University, almost 20 years, gosh, time flies. <laughs> and Tom is a very, very productive uh, scholar. He published 200, 250 articles that index is 64, and the overall citation more than 15,000. And also, he uh, published a, or co-authored eight books. Currently, he's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Marine Chemistry. Tom is uh, not only is uh, published many very well cited paper, but also he have a two Fulbright Research Award and also a fellow of American Society of Advanced of the Science, AAAS. And, uh, you know, we also received the name of the Geochemical Fellow of the Geochemical Society, and also the European Society of Geochemistry Fellow, and the Fellow of the Science of Limnology and Oceanography. And also, is a re he received a, a friendship medal of the Qilu of the Shandong province in China. And uh, also 2019, he became a fellow of um, uh, AGU. So uh, it's uh, um, Tom, uh, we just are looking forward to his talk. But I will see today we have many uh, participants, many audience from China. Um, in 24 hours, tomorrow this time will be the Ch Chinese New Year Eve. So I think Xin uh, Hao to our Chinese colleague. So happy, happy New Year. So uh, Tom, now you can uh, share your screen. Thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. I wish my mom was listening. But um, so okay, so let's let's get down to the more important things. Um, I thank you for uh, joining, and um, I just really have to thank Paul again for putting this series together. This uh, will be something that will be treasured uh, for many years. I've already started using uh, some of these lectures in in graduate classes. So, so today I'll, I'll talk to you about this uh, sort of changes in the dynamics of carbon burial uh, across the source to sink paradigm that we've been looking at. Um, then let me, why is it not going to the next slide? Um, okay, there. So uh, just some acknowledgements of, of various uh, funding sources. And of course, more importantly, because I wouldn't have anything to talk about without all of these people 
um, that have worked in my lab um, with the data that I'll be talking about, postdocs, some of those faces you recognize and past students and so on. Um, so the seminar outline goes something like this. We'll, we'll start with looking at these, uh, these distinct zones of, of activity uh, across this source to sink uh, system and how that's changing. Uh, talk a little bit about the history of carbon budgets. Um, and then the second part will be, uh, again, look giving some examples around the globe um, and how these systems are changing. And then just a few slides at the end, um, very few actually, on just the, the potential role of priming, something I've been interested in and uh, uh, that I think might fit, fit in nicely with the source to sink uh, uh, model. So uh, the first category here, we'll move and on to this. And let me just um, let me just get the laser pointer. Okay. So this is an early John Hedges paper that, uh, and and even Berner and others, of course, precede this. These units are in pterograms, and this is where we start getting some of the early models of looking at categories of carbon and how it's buried and where it's buried in the ocean. This is sort of the world total. And you can see these deltaic uh, shelves are always been uh, very important, viewed as very important. And then other various uh, systems within the aquatic zone and oxic basins and so on. And as this starts to evolve and people start adding different information to it and updating techniques and so on, here it is again uh, in pterograms, um, uh, burial rates. And you can see again that the deltaic sediments, of course, uh, here, Bernard separates out the non-deltaic and then gives a value for all of the continental margins. And then we added another one. This is Rick Smith, the student of mine. And, and this sort of uh, is not new. I mean, certainly Svitsky had published uh, really, really uh, super work on the fjords uh, early on in the 70s and 80s. And so this was sort of a rehashing and a reintroduction of the importance of fjords in this global view of where um, materials getting buried. So with all of that sort of summarized, you see this number typically in, in the literature, 80 to 90% of the total carbon being buried in and around the coastal margins uh, based on that data that I just showed. Uh, so what is the reason for this? Again, uh, this is sort of introductory for many people, but uh, these are the, the major drivers that um, are the reason for such high burial rates, very high sedimentation rates in the near shore, uh, changes in redox as a result of high carbon loading. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, from the 90s and even early on, uh, Larry Mayer and others uh, looking at aggregates in uh, surface area as, as being important. Um, and then of course, the as the biogeochemistry folks, or the, I should say the organic geochemistry folks, have played more of a role with biomarkers and things, selective preservation of different types of uh, certain compounds that are more decay resistant or labile. Uh, the other one here is of course, geopolymerization. These are the kinds of things that happen outside of the uh, machinery of a cell uh, where you can get condensation reactions and things like that to link these sort of odd molecules uh, that can accumulate. And then another thing uh, that I'll talk about a little bit is potentially the role of this reactive iron in enhancing uh, carbon burial. So these, it's not everything that contributes um, to enhanced carbon burial, but um, at least a sort of a, a top list of six maybe. Um, this paper uh, was one that we, we Jean's on there uh, on the on on the call here, and Jim Bauer was the leader of this effort. Um, essentially, the main message of this in sort of pre-industrial and present-day um, comparisons of this uh, carbon budget in terms of looking at inputs from rivers and estuaries, what makes it out to the open ocean, what goes out to the atmosphere what comes into the atmosphere and so on, you know, basically uh, you can distill, there's a lot of detail in that paper, but you know, the oceans essentially over time, uh, even through these changes that I showed in the carbon budgets as that carbon budget has evolved, uh, the oceans become more of a net sink um, based on sort of eutrophication issues and things like that. 
even within those zones, you can have hot spots of net source, but uh, the majority of, of the coastal ocean has become more of a net sink uh, uh, due to uh, largely to nutrients and so on. Um, so as we sort of go through this talk, I'll take you for a tour um, through sort of the aquatic continuum uh, from source to sink. Uh, you can see the mountains here. This is some work from Nick Ward that uh, we published again, just looking at various molecules. There have been a number of, of, of versions of this aquatic continuum uh, in different papers and so on. Uh, but essentially the idea is that as you move through this system, um, uh, there's different types of organic matter that are preserved, different inputs, depending upon uh, the, the basin and uh, the types of soils in, in these systems, whether the systems are levied or not, the anthropogenic effect, how much um, damming may have Im impacted this uh, pathway of a particle from the source of the mountain, let's say mountains to the sea. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the dissolved components, but I'm trying to keep this more focused on particulates as it relates to the source to sink uh, concept. So again, here you can see the idea that, you know, these sort of hydrophilic components uh, pass through uh, the soil layers um, with hydrophobic components accumulating and you have groundwater or base flow uh, compared to overland flow that deliver from these mountains to streams into the rivers and so on. And, and, and again, there's this already this sort of selective um, transport that's occurring in the soils before we even get to streams and then ultimately rivers. So you have this sort of chrome chromatographic kind of separation occurring uh, of compounds. Um, one of my favorite figures that I continue to use um, from Neil Blair and, and Bob Aller is the, this sort of other view that came in uh, to play. And that's sort of stepping back and looking at the, 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 the margin itself, right? Not just sort of getting into the real details of subhabitats and things like this. So this, this laid the groundwork for really connecting the idea of source to sink and how these particles move from the mountains to the ocean. In some cases, you have a passive margin like the Amazon, where you get lots of recycling. You get lots of modern and aged material. Of course, you get modern material out here as well in these sort of active margins, like maybe Taiwan, some of these areas in Papua New Guinea, you have this shorter residence time, uh, rapid input into the coastal margin. With that comes a lot of kerogen, deep erosion, of course, lots of modern material, and then of course the modern as well. So this was a really nice template uh, to look at this. And of course, uh, this is organic carbon normalized to surface area, uh, bringing in the importance of um, the surface area component, like I mentioned. Um, and then we, I'll be talking to you today a little bit about some of these hot spots in these different types of margins and how carbon gets buried and how this is being altered in the Anthropocene. We'll talk a little bit about deltas. We'll talk a little bit about some of the high latitude systems and so on, um, fjords and, and, and so on. Um, one of the other things that I think is really important that has been kicking around in uh, the terrestrial literature for some time, you, many of you know about critical zone science. It's become a big topic in National Science Foundation. Some of you are already funded by this. And this concept was, was sort of easy uh, to, to perceive in, in the terrestrial realm. Uh, with spatial dimensions and, and, and time. Um, actually, I should say uh, time uh, and spatial dimensions here. Uh, but the point is it was mostly, mostly driven by uh, terrestrial folks. Um, we just sort of put another little spin on this in thinking about some of the in, uh, distinct uh, zones that may be very active in uh, the transit of this material from uh, across this source to sink where there may be more intense remineralization or throughput and so on. And we're creating these new barriers. And I think this is very important um, to look at, uh, not only in terms of geochemistry, but there are more and more people also looking at it in terms of um, uh, sort of the evolutionary aspects of microbes and other things in it and adapt, in it adapting to uh, uh, 
uh, metabolizing different materials as we change the residence time. One of the interesting aspects that I'm just going to put a little plug on here, this is a paper that is just pretty much accepted. Uh, we're just making some final edits on. Um, and this, this sort of brings in the idea of sort of these established animal sediment relationships and communities that we have in the sink areas as you deliver material from the continents to the ocean. Uh, if you've taken any courses in animal sediment relations and bioturbation, things like that, there are these sort of classic faunal communities. Well, these things are changing. Uh, and it's another thing that I believe we need to sort of be mindful of. Of course, this is sort of a model version of how organisms are moving to higher latitudes because of uh, climate war uh, warming. Uh, of course, the temperatures on land are changing. They're not as buffered. Uh, as water systems are, uh, aquatic systems are. But you do see here, there are large, uh, of course, the commercial species get first preference here in terms of the economics. You can see this uh, migration of organisms like lobsters. You've seen the same thing with, uh, with some of the other king crabs and things like that. And so there are other many species that are move, many other species that are moving along with these uh, as we're finding. And so these communities and the way the material gets processed once you deliver it to the coastal margin is going to be evolving. And that's something that is not getting, uh, I, I don't believe has gotten the recognition that's needed. So that's a moving target. And that's what that paper, uh, we have a paper that's coming out, certainly recognize some of the names on this that uh, sort of covered a lot of the animal sediment part that I was not comfortable with. Uh, and so I, I, this is what this addresses. And I think that's another thing I'll just sort of mention briefly. So let's get to the next section of the, the paper. That's sort of a brief introduction on sort of the budgets, um, uh, some of the pathways, some of the important zones, and uh, some of the anthropogenic changes that may be occurring. So these are the sites that I'll be talking about. And it's quite a few of them, but I'll just be talking about a slide or two in each site um, hitting on the, the, the sort of the salient points. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to mention some of the uh, techniques I'll be using. Many of you are familiar with these. Uh, certainly, we'll be talking a little bit about some compound-specific isotope analysis and, um, with radiocarbon. Um, I'm not sure if I have stable isotope. I think most of it's radiocarbon. Uh, we'll also be talking about this ramp paralysis oxidation method, which relates um, the amount of carbon in the sediments and its age to lability or recalcitrance, an interesting uh, work that um, it's mentioned in the Hemingway paper, but Brad Rosenheim and Valia Galli have uh, been uh, big proponents of this. And then um, this is uh, from a book with uh, Liz Canuel um, that we published uh, a while back. And this is just sort of showing some of the biomarkers. We'll, I'll be mentioning some uh, pigments, lipids, various things that are, are used for tracing uh, marine terrestrial soil carbon. So let's go to the Mississippi first, um, the one that I've worked with quite a bit with colleagues at Tulane. You can see the large footprint it has uh, in drainage basin. This just shows you a hydrograph with the role of different tributaries in the upper part of the basin, the Ohio um, uh, the upper Mississippi and the Missouri. Uh, this is from a station, again, uh, collected down by New Orleans. Uh, and you can see, you know, the role of the Ohio is, is really sort of the source of the water and the source of the particles is typically the Missouri and the way you, you look at what's being delivered to, um, to the lower basin. Um, if you look at some work that we did, um, we, had, we did this with dissolved organic matter too, but again, you can see that there's obviously different types of loading uh, during different parts of the hydrograph. Uh, this just shows POC. A lot of the POC at the high flow is from terrestrial material. A lot of the POC at the low flow, uh, because of changes in the availability of light, are from, from uh, in situ uh, freshwater phytoplankton. So what does that mean as a particle's moving uh, from the upper part of this source to sink as it transits through a big river system? Well, one of the things I think that's been ignored, and this is something I've talked to Brent McKee and Meet Allison 
quite a bit about, um, particularly in our collaboration at Tulane. Um, and so it is, is the role of, of the salt ledge moving in and out? I mean, this is something that's well established in estuaries, but I would say is not very well established in large river systems for explored. And so as this salt wedge moves in, you start to get this coagulation precipitation and this greater flux to the sediment. So you can trap particles that are on their way from the upper basin to the river and store it in the bottom of the sediment. Uh, stored in the bottom of the riverbed. Now, uh, Brent had this really interesting data that I don't believe he ever published. Um, and you can see this is ammonia, uranium, uh, phosphate, sulfate, manganese, and so on. The main part, the, the, the main point here is as you, and this is in the lower Mississippi River, as you, as you essentially uh, store this material um, in the lower part during this, this is sort of November, low flow. You look at the pore waters in the riverbed and you can see this recharge, this buildup of material reacting, this diagenetic products. And then you move this to May and you flush the system out. Look at how everything drops dramatically. So there is this storage um, of, of material that I think is sometimes ignored when oceanographers and, and people think of this sort of flume-like connection between the upper basin to the coast without this sort of lower uh, diagenetic uh, processing that's going on the lower river. We see the same thing, Martha Satula was a postdoc and you can see we had stations upper uh, river, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the lower part of the river, but these are the upper stations and then some out on the shelf. Uh, this is station one and two, but basically if you look at station one, and you look at um, the dissolved organic carbon, you see the same thing. You see this buildup in July in the pore waters, uh, and in April, you see this drop. Um, I won't take you through how this changes. Of course, you can see that you get this release of soluble reactive phosphorus that's stored in the sediments once you move out, and you start getting the effects of sulfate um, uh, releasing uh, uh, that, that phosphorus in, in um, and this is, uh, through uh, those reactions. Now, as you move out, so that's a little bit about storage in the lower river that I just very briefly talked about. So this idea of, of, of this pulsing of sediments moving and flushing out. What happens when you get out on the shelf? Well, when you get out on the shelf, we've heard a lot about this. Bob Aller and others have talked about this. You have these mobile muds, fluid muds coming out um, in these areas where you get lots of, of sedimentation. This is showing beryllium seven inventories at different different times of the year, different uh, discharge, um, and essentially uh, off. The, this is again you can see off the river mouth. The river exits here at Southwest Pass. This is the inner shelf, and you have these hot spots of uh, deposition. Beryllium is a good uh, tracer for this terrestrial uh, material uh, with atmospheric inputs. In this region, essentially, you can almost ignore. Um, so that's sort of showing the bullseyes of where this, these particles are, are, are being deposited. Um, and then more at my side uh, of the interest of this is sort of how does this material, not just within the immediate area of the bird's foot delta, but this whole margin I'll be talking about, this is Mississippi extending over to uh, the Ashafalaya, this whole area I'm viewing as this one large uh, delta system. So if you look at the terrestrial carbon first, we'll look at that and you can see that this is percent organic matter um, in spring and in fall. And there is region one, two, and three. These are just regions in terms of moving from the near shore out. Um, the, the point is that you can see that, um, you know, you can have a fairly high amount of, of marine carbon being stored in these, these systems, these sediments. Uh, and of course, the, the amount of coming from marshes in the river, we try to distinguish between those two very different sources, viewing that as terrestrial. Um, so essentially, you can see um, this marsh material being up near around 30, 40%. You can see the river material reaching up around 60%, 50 to 60% certain times, certain regions, certain times of the year. Um, and other people have looked at this long before we got involved in this um, E and Treffree. And this, these are showing contours of carbon in and around. So you think about the beryllium 
um, uh, sedimentation, the, the mobile muds that are moving in and around here. And, um, you know, these papers have sort of made reference that, uh, you know, this terrestrial carbon is delivered. Um, um, and, and that really, you know, if you look at the balance of what's coming out of the river uh, and what gets stored in here, as these papers indicate, um, it seems like there's not a good, a very good balance in terms of what's expected to be stored there. So where, where does this fraction of, there seems to be a missing fraction of, um, of terrestrial material in these, these uh, sediments. And how important is transport offshore? You can see the Mississippi Canyon sitting here. Well, this is something that we, I had a student, uh, Troy Sampier look at, and we had transects coming right out to the canyon, um, right out from Southwest Pass, and then some other transects here. So here's the main uh, message from this paper, uh, from this figure here is, as you go from the river out to the canyon, you can see that there's an accumulation I should say that there's a decrease. Let's look at this uh, uh, graph first, uh, this data first. This is the total lignin, lignin being a biomarker of terrestrial material. So that decreases as you go offshore, which is not surprising. But the other thing that happens, is that just a dilution effect or is it really um, terrestrial material being broken down? And here you can see this is another line going up, which shows essentially the acid to aldehyde ratio which is a rough index of how uh, lignin moieties are being broken down. Maybe not pure lignin molecules, but lignin moieties, let's say. So material is making its way out there and it's being decomposed. Um, the other thing that you can look at and think about these bullseyes uh, as they relate to the beryllium again, and you can see these are hot spots that follow the beryllium sedimentation pretty well. Uh, and these are chlorophyll A and fucoxanthin. So these are say, sort of tracing uh, phytoplankton. So I talked to you a little bit about terrestrial material. This is now showing in the mobile muds, this deposition of these diatoms uh, that are soaking up a lot of this nitrate that's coming out of the river. So where does this material go? Um, we looked after um, a hurricane event out in the canyon and you can see beryllium makes its way out there. So there's quite a bit of beryllium uh, out there, more than what you'd normally expect. Um, the other thing, you can't see this very well. Again, um, this is some work also uh, we published, and there's some other work published by uh, Liz Canuel and her student uh, on, on similarly supporting this. The idea that if you look out in the deeper sediments, you see a lot more phytoplankton than can be really supported by uh, surface waters out there. And so what this is showing is essentially that not only is terrestrial material being shunted out with these mobile muds during these big events, um, but you're also getting, as, as I showed before, the fucoxanth and the chlorophyll A, some of these phytoplankton that were produced near shore getting shunted out. Now, this is something I have to thank Peter Tailing for, uh, who was previous speaker. He sent me this. And he's been doing some really fabulous work on trying to get people reinterested in the idea of the importance of these canyons as um, uh, pathways or, or sinks, the ultimate sink, so to speak, of material. Uh, and this is really a bizarre thing. When you see this much terrestrial material with blue water in the background, those two things just simply don't go hand in hand. He sent me this uh, pointing out, this was off the coast of uh, Madagascar where uh, a, a cable uh, had broken. Um, and, and basically uh, this is a company out there repairing uh, the cable uh, and they brought up this <laughs> terrestrial material uh, that you can see making its way out to these. So you can get this material being shunted out to these areas very quickly. Um, during these big storms. What about the idea of, of these areas potentially storing paleo, uh, paleo data? Um, this is again from Troy Sampier's work. Um, you can see this, um, essentially these are indices. This is the 50 meter um, station. So it's fairly near shore. Uh, we have lignin that we're looking at here. And one of the interesting things is despite the movement of these mobile muds and transport of labile and refractory material out to the deeper canyon, you still see records of Camille 
and Betsy, these storms from 1965 and 1970 being stored in some of the deeper sediments. These were uh, collected by large piston cores. Uh, so, so again, some of this material is in fact being stored long-term and, and recording these big events. Um, Gail Kinnicky, uh, just to, to um, mention some other aspects of this transport, not all the transport gets move, uh, is moving in offshore. Gail did some uh, really nice work on uh, fluid muds a little bit west, more by the Shafalaya Basin. Uh, and how essentially some of these cold front passages can, can lead to uh, this onshore uh, conditions uh, through attenuated wave action and sort of uh, uh, ameliorating uh, erosion in these areas. And, and again, some of this happens um, through changes in the evolution from low, low energy, pre-front, front, post-front, and so on. Uh, again, this is this is more uh, fluid muds uh, rather than the mobile muds, a bit more neat, uh, non-Newtonian. But it, uh, the point here is, is that uh, it's not all offshore. There are some other interesting dynamics, uh, buffering erosion and kind of storing material, crunching it down into the sediments in the near shore, uh, depending upon the physics. So another interesting area in Louisiana that we've worked on is, uh, is, is Wax Lake Delta. This was created in 1941, uh, an outlet to provide relief of uh, flooding and so on from the lower Shafalaya. They have this beautiful, largely sandy type uh, footprint. And one of the things we looked at is how, how does an embryonic delta start storing carbon? So as you move from the inner to the intermediate to the outer delta. This is the older intermediate, obviously the younger age. And you can see what it looks like. 38 years old is sort of more vegetated, 26. And then 13 is pretty much open sand flats. How, how is uh, carbon stored here? One of the things we find is that 15% um, of the organic carbon in these sediments, uh, this is work from another student of mine, Mike Shields, uh, this is where I bring in some of the iron, the importance of iron. Uh, how important is iron in binding carbon in this sort of evolving system, um, this chrono sequence that we have, which is very, very nice, uh, a unique situation to, to uh, look at. And it, it turns out that about 15% is um, bound to uh, uh, reactive iron. Um, now, there are different ways that reactive iron binds to carbon um, or carbon binds to reactive iron uh, essentially is that it can precipitate out as in Fe2 coming to the surface in pore waters. You can have that precipitate out as it gets oxidized and it can capture DOC. Another way is to just have material uh, coming from uh, fluvial inputs soar onto particles, um, iron particles. And so, um, we, we haven't published this yet, but using Mossbauer uh, spectroscopy, you can see that there are different um, uh, oxides that are involved in this. Ferrohydrite seems to be the dominant one in the more vegetated sediments. That is the where we're getting more reducing conditions, higher organic matter compared to the sandy ones further offshore. And there we seem to be, it seems to be that the ferrohydrite is the dominant uh, mineral involved in this precipitation process. Whereas you move into the sandy outer reaches of the delta, uh, it's more hematite that appears to be coming more from the land uh, and uh, moving out, coming from the, uh, the um, uh, river uh, and moving out and sorption is occurring. But again, this is still uh, very preliminary. So if you look at some of the final work uh, that we have from this Delta, you can see this is carbon stock in kilograms uh, per square meter. And you can see again, as you move, uh, there's a nice relationship with stock and depth of, of um, uh, mean low water uh, depth of the Delta. And you can see the outer edges not storing as much as you would expect compared to the inner. And then of course, you can also uh, layer in the importance of uh, surface area um, uh, on this accumulation in this growing footprint in this evolving um, uh, delta. One of the other things that come out of this uh, work is sort of the role of um, different types of 
of uh, not only the coprecipitation and sorption, but it seems like uh, the lignin phenols preferentially sorbed um, to the younger, um, um, and, and there were certain uh, lignin phenols that were more involved in this than others. Um, but the point is that you, you can see when you, when you look sort of beyond just sort of the bulk um, role of, 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 of reactive iron with carbon, when you start looking at the biomarkers, you can start seeing differences um, in, in, in some of the, the acidic components of, um, of, of the amino acids uh, as related to some of the others and so on. That, that I don't wanna to get too much into that. Uh, but again, there's a lot of interesting things going on in terms of, uh, of selection of, of different types of compounds that get sorbed uh, or precipitated. Um, if you look at some of the work that we've been doing in, with a group at Ocean University, uh, Dong Lee worked in my lab for a bit as a visiting some, uh, student. Uh, and so if we moved over to uh, the Chanjang, uh, which we've worked on for, for a number of years, there's a lot of shear going on with the currents there that sort of hold these mobile muds um, in and around. You can see the currents are very, very intense. Tides are very large. Uh, and so the mobile mud belt here um, is something we've been very interested in. Um, uh, Bo Chow is another person that we've worked with. He used lots of radionuclides, different radionuclides, um, a, a fairly nice suite of radionuclides, I should say, uh, to look at the depth of the, um, the mobile muds uh, over different seasons and around this area. So this, this area has been of particular interest and then when you start looking at what's in these mobile muds in and around here, again, this is work with Peng Yao. Um, here you can see median grain size, surface area, total organic carbon, del C13. Um, again, you can see the surface area linking nicely with the mobile muds. Uh, you see nice changes in the terrestrial separating out with sort of the more terrestrial and the marine signal and so on. And so, um, um, and, and the median grain size as well. And so how does that relate to how this other sorting is occurring uh, post-depositionally? Um, we used another mixing model, uh, isotopic mixing model. Um, and this is looking at marine, soil, and vascular plants in and around offshore of the uh, Chanjung. And again, you can see um, a nice separation of the marine uh, carbon out here. You can see the soils really accumulating as you would expect in and around where the, um, this material is, is separating out. And then the other nice thing that we see is um, the vascular plant material also. And some of this could very well be from local marshes. Now, one of the other interesting things when you look at mobile muds is that they have a very, very high uh, metabolic rate. Bob Aller uh, was one of the first to really sort of talk about this in 1998. So this is this is looking at total organic carbon in the surface area in a variety of different systems. And this is sort of your ligotrophic deep ocean that's been burned out. Um, and you can see the mobile muds um, uh, in and around here are pretty low. So there's a lot of burn off, even though there's a lot of burial going on there. There's also a lot of burn off as well. And you can see the sediments that I was just showing you in and around the Chanjang and a little bit south of there are also um, uh, showing this burned off feeling, even some of the sandy regions that are receiving some of this organic carbon, uh, not likely produced in the sandy regions. Speaking of moving material around in the Anthropocene, as you take particles and move them from land to the coast, another interesting thing that we looked at, uh, Bin Zhao here, is the different sort of sedimentary regimes in and around this margin between the Yellow uh, River and uh, the Chanjang. And you have this big uh, patch of mud here that was released from the north as you changed the, the uh, river direction to the um, uh, uh, Yellow River Delta, which has moved around. And there was a lot of this material eroded from the abandonment of that river source. And it moved down into this region here. Um, and so we wanted to look at how the sort of the in, do some incubation studies on the difference between these mobile muds that are very active and sort of this abandoned region that had moved down from the old Yellow River Delta. And again, not surprisingly, you see about 16.8% of the sedimentary organic carbon 
uh, was decomposed in these very active mobile uh, but um, belt mobile mud belts, excuse me, and only about 5.4 percent under these controlled incubation studies. So these different sedimentary regimes in these deltaic regions in terms of where particles get deposited from this source to sink is very, very important, as I mentioned before, not only with animals migrating now, but also just in the shifting conditions, very, very dynamic. You, uh, when you talk about these regions, you really need to be very specific about the region near field, far field that you're talking about from the river. Um, again, a reflection of this shows um, you can see looking at a separation, again, looking in this mobile mud belt area. This is uh, Jim Peng. And basically, we see um, it, this is lambda, this is del C13, del C13 CN uh, of these uh, uh, systems collected in here. And essentially, the, the major point is that you see the vascular plant material uh, basically falling out in the high density, uh, uh, sorry, in the low density fractions. So this is, these are density, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. This, these are actually density, not surface area. Um, and density is a little bit different to look at, but essentially what we're seeing is, is um, that the, the vascular plants look much more, appear to, vascular plant material appears to be much more associated uh, with the low density particles collected from the sediments um, and so on. And the high density fractions were dominated by marine. Now, some of that could be, the, the um, release of uh, terrestrial material as it moves into the coastal environment and potential uh, absorption of marine material that people have looked at, Fred Prowl and others, you know, some years ago. So we don't really know why. But again, this is another interesting aspect of how particles are um, moving about. Now, I want to move to something different here. If you look at um, this, is, this is data from all these regions in red. And you can see we have um, uh, radiocarbon, del C13 here. And I just want to focus, there's this a lot of data to talk about. I just want to focus on these gray areas here, which essentially are Arctic regions. And as then you see that, as, that these really have a much older age than some of these other coastal regions in terms of particles and sediment particles in the coastal zone. And of course, this is well known. Many people have looked at this. Um, and, and we're getting to the role of permafrost uh, being released into the uh, coastal margin, another uh, anthropogenic driver of what we're seeing uh, that can um, uh, create some barriers in terms of understanding how, how age relates to um, decay. And, and we looked at uh, the Colville River, as you can see up here, in Northern Alaska, this is continuous permafrost drainage basin. Um, this was work that I did with um, Katie Schreiner, um, and um, this is where we get into a little bit of the ramp paralysis. So we wanted to see how much of this material in the coastal margin uh, is reflected in what we see in the inner uh, reaches of, of the, um, the drainage basin. And so essentially what you see here, this is uh, one station collected, this is the delta. Right here's the ocean up here, the Arctic Ocean, um, and then we have another station collected in the watershed further inland. And if you look at essentially the thermograph, this is PCO2 released on this axis. This is the radiocarbon age on this. So essentially, and this is temperature. So this is the pyrolysis temperature, um, and essentially, you know, the amount of carbon that's older that comes off at the higher temperature and the younger carbon seems to come off at the uh, lower temperature. And, and so um, what we're seeing here is very similar signature of what we see at the Delta and what we see in soils. So this is two centimeters at the Delta and 40 to hundred centimeters uh, soil depth. So the major mechanism for moving this material from the interior to the coast is very, very rapid transport. Uh, you can see bank erosion in some of, the, some of the local tributaries here that we believe are largely responsible when flow really picks up and transports a lot of this 
permafrost rapidly to the coast. That's very different than what we see with dissolved organic carbon, which in some cases is actually altered by the time it gets to the coast because some of this permafrost is so labile. So this permafrost is very old material, but it's still very fresh, uh, as many of you know. And, and one of the interesting things that comes out from this is sort of a whole different view on the way we look at the age of carbon. We typically look at old carbon as being degraded and reworked for quite a bit. In the Arctic, it changes the whole paradigm of that. Uh, and you can see the labile material being very uh, old in, in the case of DOC. This is some work that uh, we published um, in 2017. Some of this material, is, it gets transferred into the food web where you can see um, waterfowl like ducks and various things like that that have radiocarbon tissue ages of uh, 8,000 years old and even invertebrates that have very short lifespans, um, 2,000 years old. So going to continuing on the fjords, um, we essentially um, reintroduced this idea of fjords now representing maybe 11% of the uh, carbon. And again, uh, from this figure, you can see when you look at an area normalized rate, the fjords are very, very important, even though when you look at it uh, just in terms of uh, deposition per year, it's much smaller. So they have a very small footprint, but um, in, in many cases, and maybe not all cases, um, again, we had sort of a limited sampling of deltas uh, of fjords, excuse me, data uh, in this. Um, some other work that we've been doing with collaborators in um, in Scotland on on um, on these fjords brings out an interesting perspective of how fjords bury carbon relative to the peatlands. The peatlands are considered to be the big stores if you talk to a scientist in Scotland, and in, in Scotland, and they are for sure. If you look at carbon stocks. You can see, um, and by the way, these two colors here represent sedimentary organic carbon and inorganic carbon is the light color uh, for fjords. And this is peatlands, right? So total amounts, again, the peatlands win. Uh, but when you start looking at the aerial differences, the peatlands obviously have a much larger area than fjords, right, in square kilometers. So then when you take this information and you look at it in terms of per square kilometer, uh, you can see, again, um, this is what the peatlands have, but look at the scale for fjords. This is an order of magnitude, so the scales here are different, right? So this is for fjords, and this is the peatlands in with some other areas here. So it's an order of magnitude higher in comparison to that. Um, as we look at the role of fjords in this sort of source to sink. Some of the other interesting things that changes now um, it, it, um, with um, these fjords is, is sort of these gradients that we've seen in New Zealand as you go from north to south. Uh, you have big gradients of rain changes in rainfall and elevation, high rainfall, high elevation, higher frequency of landslides in these regions. And then as you move south, you get a, a very different pattern of uh, geomorphology in these fjords. So what does that do to radiocarbon? Um, this is up north, up in here, you can see uh, uh, fraction modern. Um, and that fraction modern decreases um, as you go into the more southern fjords. So here you're transporting very quickly through landslides and so on, material, fresh vegetation material into the bottom of the fjord, uh, unlike uh, these uh, um, lower topographic areas. And, and so here you can see again, uh, these uh, fraction of modern of New Zealand fjords, uh, these here compared to some others. And again, you can see how the Arctic um, is, tends to have this much older age, but again, not in all. So this whole idea of old material and young material making it in is an interesting idea. And we looked at this in Southeast Alaska um, and you can see essentially uh, some of these fjords were glaciated and some of them were not. And when you look in the glaciated fjords, you see that there's a lot more petrogenic material being bulldozed in compared to the non-glaciated, which have a lot of carbon bearing. 
Um, and you can see these numbers are, are radically different. This is a lot of petrogenic material uh, being buried. So that changes the mechanism. And as you start retreating glaciers in the Anthropocene, uh, what does that do to this kind of delivery? Well, another thing that needs to be considered is how reactive petrogenic material is relative to uh, material that is more in connection with uh, the CO2 cycle um, uh, as it relates to phytoplankton. And really nice work by Blattman, uh, one of Tim Eglinton's students, uh, looks at this sort of uh, pedogenic material coming from, let's say, smectite, and then you, you have um, uh, this more rapid injection of older uh, petrogenic material, let's say, from Taiwan. Uh, and this is more connected. These particles essentially uh, have this reactivity uh, with the marine uh, carbon, whereas petrogenic material settles out essentially um, sort of is a somewhat more decoupled from the CO2 cycle. So that's going to be an interesting uh, 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 thing to look at with, with advancing um, uh, warming in the, in the Arctic. And here we, we published a paper um, that looks at these fjords in the Arctic. And one of the interesting things is um, as you start to retreat the glaciers, you start opening up areas that can allow for more reactivity as this material comes off. So normally you had material at the glacier's edge, the tidal glacier just dumping material in. As you retreat this glacier back, you start to open up an area that can be filled in by vegetation. It increases residence time and you're starting to change the way this material reacts with the, with the margin. Uh, Svalbard is an area where a lot, we heard uh, uh, some very nice work uh, about a week ago um, about this. Um, and um, you can see as you start to retreat the glacier back, this is from 1948, 1984, you start to create these small deltas. And so I started thinking about this. And when you think about uh, sort of an earlier version of this story, uh, we have the, the, uh, a footprint of, 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 an, of this that existed, that was formed about 14,000 years ago. So this is very different than anything that you see. Most of the fjords in, 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 uh, in New Zealand have this very sharp drop off. So here you have uh, this delta that retreated again at the last glacial maximum and essentially retreated and left this big footprint. And so we wanted to see um, how that compares in terms of just looking at acid to aldehyde ratios of material you find that's shunted into deep water, like over here, versus material that you find that's coming from the Camelot River. And of course, you find that the acid to aldehyde ratios in this area are just much higher than what you find in the more fresher, faster material. So this is um, an idea that we had to look at what we predict might happen in the future with the Arctic. My final few slides, and I'm finished, um, is the role of, of priming. And, and this has been an idea that's been also been kicking around in the soil community for many years, um, from the 20s and 30s, even as it relates to agricultural uh, practices. Uh, this I have an example just with DOC, where you can take algal material, you can combine it with terrestrial DOC, um, and essentially this results in greater breakdown of the terrestrial DOC than if it had not come in contact with the algae. Okay, the idea of it being primed now, it becomes more available. Um, I published a paper looking at potential hotspots, again, from uh, source to sink, places where we might expect this in the aquatic system. And these are some of those hot spots, river confluences, reservoirs, where you change the residence time, you increase the reactivity. And what you do is you bring green and brown water together. And we've published some work on this in the Amazon, Nick Ward, which I'm not gonna show you, uh, as well as in river plumes, where you have this algal exudates coming in contact with terrestrial material that may enhance the breakdown of that terrestrial material more than if it had not come in contact with the algae. So again, that's just uh, very briefly mentioning that my final uh, point here is just, um, we published a, a special um, session, uh, I should say a, a article on this um, 
um, it looking at the role of priming um, in, in, a, in terrestrial and aquatic systems. Um, this was a special issue. I didn't say, I didn't mean to say special article, a special issue. Um, and one of the really cool papers that came out of this is some work by uh, Bob Aller and Kirk Cochran looking at the uh, priming uh, in sediments. So most of the work I've been doing has been in the water. Uh, DOC, but this is a really good one in terms of looking at sediments uh, in the context of, of this. So my final thoughts are that, uh, you know, these lands uh, use changes, uh, damming uh, and changing the pathway and residence time of particulates as they make their way uh, uh, will certainly um, affect the, the uh, reactivity of material in selective preservation. Uh, zones of deglaciation may change the residence time uh, processing, as I mentioned before, um, and that will be very different depending upon the fjords that you're looking at. Um, priming, I think, has been largely ignored and needs to be looked at. And then finally, um, this idea of changing the animal sediment relationship in the receiving basin and what that means as a moving target when you deposit particles um, Again, this has been looked at more from a, a biodiversity perspective and not uh, a biogeochemistry perspective. And I'll stop there. Hey, Tom, thank you uh, very, very much for this fantastic overview and review of this uh, carbon burial uh, topic. Uh, you talk about all the with a large river from uh, the Sibir River to the Yangtze, the small river to the Taiwan, and uh, tropical to high latitude food. This is a great, this is a, I think this is a, for the graduate student, this is a master watch presentation. But uh, before I give the floor to the audience to ask a question. So uh, if you want, have any question, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. And so, but before I give that, uh, uh, before I give that to them, uh, I want to mention this, uh, um, I mentioned this Friday, the talk, but also I want to say this uh, next week. Oh, uh, okay, so uh, next week uh, we have Neil and also Hans Paul. Both will talk about the carbon related stuff. I think we here this week, next week, and we have a feast of organic carbon talks. So uh, please uh, uh, come. If you want to receive the email about every week, you can send me an email. I can put it into our email list, or you can uh, just uh, uh, follow our Twitter account. So every week we will tweet out, you know, like uh, you know the talk today, and uh, or you can follow us on the YouTube. So all the talk, like today, this one is on live. So after 24 hours, we'll be archived on the YouTube. So, but anyway, so uh, now we give to audience. If you have any question, please uh, unmute yourself. Go ahead to ask. I think Dave. Dave, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, wonderful talk, Tom. Really enjoyed it. Man, the diversity in depositional environments you're examining is incredible. Uh, but I had a question about the uh, Yellow Sea and East China Sea where you were uh, stating that there was a difference in kind of organic carbon processing comparing the uh, kind of the old Yellow River Delta in the Yellow Sea to the East China Sea uh, Yang Z deposits and I, I was just and you were saying it was mainly a function of depositional environment where in the Yellow Sea you don't have the uh, the fluid mud uh, type uh, depositional environment but I was wondering if some of that old uh, uh, Yellow River uh, sediment that you were looking at it admittedly it's not a fluid mud but it's older carbon and I'm wondering if uh, some of it is, I mean, some of that's relic sediment up there and it's much older uh, riverine deltaic. And I'm wondering if it's been through microbial cycles and that makes it less reactive than uh, the depositional environment um, 
may may not be the only contributor to the difference in rate dynamics. Yeah, Dave, you're you're right on with that, and and I guess I didn't really say that very well. Um, I was sort of emphasizing um, the fact that they were coming from two different areas, but you're absolutely right. Um, and in that paper, we actually bring some of that up. So that was my fault for not mentioning that. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. It's not just the fact that you, you're taking the same material and putting it in two different depositional or um, uh, areas, um, but you're taking this older material that's probably been reworked and then shunted out to this area, this big mud patch. Uh, so it's it's not as fresh. I, I, I We do actually mention that, and that's a good point that I... I neglected to point out. I was getting caught up in the, the mobile mud frenzy. Well, the Yellow, Yellow River emptied south of the peninsula for a long, right. long time and then switched north. So a lot of that sediment is 100 years old or more. So yeah. it's had time to become a little more refractory. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Thank, I thanks. have one other question. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Just interest, I, I'd love to see the uh, climate change dynamics with the organisms, uh, you know, migrating with regard to uh, temperature changes in the water column and and climate change, and I'm wondering when you kind of showed the lobster, which are more mobile, 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 <laughs> than uh, uh, some of the more sedentary organisms. I'm wondering if you envision that process of migration of benthos as being mainly larval driven. Or do you think it's actually driven by the adults migrating uh, during their adult cycle? That's another great paper, especially from a geochemist like you. Um, that's, <laughs> great. that's great. Um, and, and this paper that we have coming well, out. Well, Aller's in it, Joe. So let's, let's, <laughs> yeah. let, he, he goes both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and other people like Leventon and so on who think about yeah. sort of evolutionary strategies with lysistotrophic larvae, planktotrophic larvae, and so on. And this is really an interesting thing that you bring up because uh, with, the, with the epibenthic organisms, these big macro species that you can move that are very mobile moving around, uh, you know, that those aren't the ones you typically think when you think of animal sediment relations. You think of more infauna that are associated with deposit feeding and detrital feeding and so on. Uh, and with respect to that sort of um, uh, graphic that I showed in terms of, of the evolution of, um, uh, or I should say the succession of different benthic communities from opportunistic to deeper burrowing uh, 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 case selected species. Um, so, so the point is that yes, they're already starting to move, Dave. I mean, you know, the thing is I use that as sort of a quick drop because it's easy to show they've been tracked you know, these commercially important species are easy to make the case to say, look, there are big things on the move in the water. It, the other ones are, are, are much more cryptic, but people who look at the cycles of these different larvae are finding them much, much further north. And our point is that you're going to start seeing more and more of that with the infauna, the more cryptic infauna, uh, not these big mobile uh, species that are, you know, maybe not representative of sort of the steady state we think about within fauna and diagenesis. Craig Smith in the Antarctic, uh, down in the Palmer Deep, noticed that there were uh, large crabs <coughs> like the king crab that migrated and they were the adults. It, it wasn't all larvae, <coughs> larval dispersal. It seemed to be the uh, adults were moving uh, to a, uh, a different temperature regime. So it'd be an interesting contrast. Yeah. Well, I'll just mention one more quick thing I didn't have time to mention in, in, in the talk is that we're looking at the effects of the mangroves migrating and replacing marshes in Florida all around the Gulf and Texas as well. And that changes the burial dynamics, as you might oh, expect sure. in terms of more woody material. Well, that's been a very plant centric subject, these blue carbon people. What's happening that we're seeing now is you're getting deeper burrowing mangrove crabs moving with the mangroves. And that's going to change the dynamics because their mixing is much more intense than fiddler crabs. And so that's something that is sort of a local example of these deeper burrowing species that will maybe offset the effect of the refractory nature of uh, the mangroves by bringing more reoxidation. So it's a really interesting mix when you start 
uh, bringing the movement of animals into this. Thanks. Great talk. Thank okay, uh, we have to uh, move. So who is next? Luigi? I saw you. Well, I, I just want to make a quick comment. I think uh, uh, Dave is right in the age difference between the Yellow River, you know, that Yellow Sea is deposit from Yellow River or Tanjiang, but uh, the material is also very different, right? So yeah. I think that the material that is organic carbon is associated with uh, that could also make a big difference, I assume. Yeah, yeah, Ab absolutely, Weijian. As I said, in, in that paper, we do mention that. I just neglected to um, uh, talk about it. So it, it's good uh, that we clarify that. that that's, a, that's, a, that's a big component of that, the slower, okay. uh, the slower remineralization. Okay, Pop okay. I really enjoy okay. it. Who, who, who is next? Next question. And hey, Hans, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Oh, Hans, we cannot hear you. We have to. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hey, Hans. Hey, ma'am. That's a great shot. It's Mr. Nitrogen over here. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just wanted to, I, I was really, uh, Great talk, by the way, and I was really fascinated by everything you talked about. Uh, on the on the issue of the diatoms that you talked about, you know, in the uh, Mississippi Delta, in the it, you know, how uh, do you guys have any idea how important they are relative to the now to the uh, alloctonous carbon in terms of the you know depositional dynamics, and secondly. How does that factor into the big arguments about hypoxia, you know, uh, that's being caused by this? Yeah, no, that's a great uh, question. I, I had um, a, a postdoc, Rebecca Green, actually look at the role of the um, uh, diatoms and fresh phytoplankton contributing to hypoxia and uh, over these different seasons, particularly during the, the uh, summer mo months. And it turns out that it, when you look at all of the um, phytoplankton, this is published uh, with a model that they ran. Um, it, it turns out that it's about 30 to 40%, suggesting that it has to be some other sources. And that's where we started to bring in the idea of potential priming of some marsh and terrestrial material, because it's so dynamic that you can take a lot of that carbon and burn it up, or you can transport it offshore. Um, there's still a lot of debate about the role of that. There's no way that I'm saying that those more refractory sources are as usable and contributed rapidly to um, hypoxia, but you can't balance the budget in terms of the oxygen uptake relative to the total carbon provided by uh, what we see sedimenting in the hotspot areas. Um, and that I can give you the reference on that paper. They used a model for that that is over my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with the, you know, with the increase in wetter storms and more runoff, obviously, this is highly dynamic. It's going to change a lot, right, with the, uh, yeah. the, plume, the huge plumes that we're seeing in our coastal zones, um, you know, the work that Chris has been doing. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty dynamic, highly dynamic situation uh, linked in with, uh, you know, this low oxygen phenomena. Yeah, yeah, and, and as I said, I, I think priming may, may be an important factor as we start to sort of peel away some of the complexity and priming really difficult to prove. I mean, lots of people don't buy it. Uh, as I said, the terrestrial folks have been working on this longer, but if you do it right and you trace everything very carefully, um, I think what we're finding is, is that, you know, the potential there is pretty high. And it was nice to see Bob Aller find this in the sediments as okay. well in that recent paper uh, with Kirk Cochran. So that's getting the idea that, that this deposition of this labile material that's being driven by nitrogen inputs is also, um, it, it is also being sort of translated into this breakdown of missing terrestrial material in this area. Not all of it's being transported offshore. I think some of it's getting burned in place. Yeah, great, great, thanks. Great talk. Thanks, okay. So uh, any other question? So Tom, I have a last question, quick question. So in one slide, you mentioned the organic carbon about 15% attached to the iron. And do you remember last week, uh, Kevin Schiffer, he talked about Yukon River permaforest. 
he mentioned a mercury, organic also attached to the mercury. So based on your study, any other heavy mineral and metal also play a major role to attach the organic carbon or carry on? Yeah, I, I think the idea of some of these other minerals are maybe outside of my area of expertise. I, I wouldn't really be able to comment on that in terms of the role of other metals. Um, of course, iron's been kicking around for a while. That, that's the one that's uh, of most interest uh, to most people looking at organic carbon preservation as it relates to uh, redox changes um, and the solubility of Fe2 and Fe3 and so on. That's, that's been around for some years. I, I really have not looked at the literature very much with other 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 metals. Uh, the, these other sort of contaminant metals, mm. yeah. Mm. These, mercury mercury is, is something that that is you know that the whole idea of that's pretty novel. That's pretty new. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the way he talked, the way he talked about it, not methyl mercury. Mm -hmm. This other this other binding is different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, th I think it's great. I'm sorry today I didn't uh, check the, the YouTube channel that, you know, but uh, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you know any other question, we can stop here. This Tom's talk is also available on the YouTube. Um, you're welcome to encourage your graduate students to rewatch this presentation. As we said, it's fantastic overview. And uh, thank you, Tom. And also thank you for your involved the East China Sea Yellow Sea. And one thing I forgot to mention, I will not surprise one day you will become an OLC member of Chinese Academy of Science. So we do, do you agree? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paul. It's nice to see all these faces that I, I normally bump into at meetings. I miss all you folks. So uh, look forward to seeing you again. Okay, okay. We